Kia Welcome to BNZ Connect. I'm Frances Cook, Investments Editor for Business Desk and host of this series. Getting paid has to be one of the most important parts of business, but often not the simplest. It needs to be a seamless experience for your customer, or you risk losing them right at that crucial moment. There is a wave of various payment options with new ones popping up all the time. Yet unfortunately, New Zealand is playing catch up on some of these technologies, especially when you compare us to places like the UK and Australia. However, no time like the present, and New Zealand is quickly embracing the digital transformation in this area. So as we get up to speed on this, I'm joined by Adrian Smith, Chief Product Officer and co-founder of BlinkPay, and Joe Rastrick, Head of Paytech and Emerging Payments at BNZ. Kia ora, welcome to you both. Thanks for coming yeah, along. Kia ora. Well, we'll start with you, Adrian. Can you start by telling us a bit about your background in the payments industry and why why this led to you founding BlinkPay? Um, so for me, for my sins, I spent most of my adult life working in London for large British banks. So my last role in the UK was the director of the digital director of the business bank for Barclays. And in my time in the in the UK doing big bank transformation, I basically built and rebuilt pretty much everything you can think of in financial services, at least twice, not always well, <laughs> to be clear, but lessons were learned. Um, and so through that and through a lot of the work we did in the European Union as part of the single market and the bringing on the PSD2, learned an awful lot around sort of payments infrastructure and building payments networks. Mm. Um, prior to that, I was at Lloyd's Banking Group where I helped build the faster payments network for the Lloyd's Banker as part of real-time payments in the UK, something that sadly was still missing in New Zealand at the moment. Mm. Hmm. Well, yeah, so you say there lessons were learned, I'm sure. Um, do you have thoughts on how those lessons apply within New Zealand? Do you have maybe a top three? Yeah, um, so one of the things that I think um, JP Morgan, they did a brilliant piece on last year called Payments Are Eating the World. Mm -hmm. And what they said is, look, Payments are ubiquitous, and from a banking perspective, they're one of the core capabilities that make banks go, right? The first thing you have is the ledger, balances, transactions in and out, then the ability to send money and receive money. Big thing. Mm. And so their, their paper really asserted or posited this idea that there is emerging trends. So for one of the ones they talked about, which I saw in the UK to a lesser degree, but more in Asia, was the rise of the super app. We have a, a smartphone application that has almost everything you could think of in the one place. And in doing so, you had payments as a key enabler of that ecosystem to be able to transact and do things in between those connected ecosystem partners. Hmm. And in doing so, it meant that instead of paying two, three subscriptions for sort of disparate services that weren't connected, you could just have one app that kind of handled it all. Another thing we saw the rise of over in the UK was this idea of embedded finance. Amazing. So there's this, as an example, Everyone's aware of buy now, pay later schemes. They did some really cool things. They do some things. They allow people in the age of instant gratification to be able to get the thing they want. Mm -hmm. um, there's some debates as to the efficacy of that. But one of the things that struck me was there's this outfit called Butter in the UK where they built a Chrome browser extension which would identify when you're in a shopping cart and then they would allow you to spin up a virtual card so they didn't actually integrate at all with the merchant. They were in your browser helping you pay for stuff. Yeah, so there's really nuts stuff like that. Um, and the other thing that we saw a lot of from a payments perspective, with the embedded things, we had the super apps. What we also had was the rise of various platforms and capabilities that were trying to bring together partners in a meaningful way and cohesive way. Because you then benefit from the network effects of if you've got a lot of producers in the same place, then the suppliers come and vice versa. If you've got a lot of um, customers and then you get a lot of producers, go join those networks and you have the rise of Amazon Marketplace and those types of things. And once again, the ability to make payments made the world go around. One of the really interesting things Amazon did was they had this one-click payment system, which if you're on the Amazon site, you just get one click and you would be able to purchase that thing for next day delivery. Mm. What they did, very interestingly, is they then enabled that capability as a module you could add to places like Shopify. And then when Shopify discovered that if you added Amazon Connect, this one-click system, into a Shopify site, it would then take that customer via the Amazon fulfillment and distribution. So then Shopify said, no, 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 no. And they put in a lot of code saying, don't do this, it's bad. Mm. So <laughs> some really interesting things like that. The ability to one-click pay, though, how good mm. is that? Yeah. So those are just some of the things I've seen overseas when I spent a lot of time over there. And of course, so much of that is focused on making it seamless, right? Making it easy to buy from these businesses. Yeah. When you look at the New Zealand context, how, 
How ready are we for that? And what can New Zealand businesses learn to make it a bit more seamless? So I think one of the, the things we live in now, and I don't think we, we really truly understand it, we're in the age of instant gratification. Think mm. smartphones, photos, look at it, don't like it, delete it, take a hundred more. And so when it comes to payments, it's the same thing. Now, with the greatest respect to the banks, they will say that we deal in trust and we you mm. bank with us, we deal in trust. But if you've got it, if it's easy and convenient, sometimes that trumps trust. I'll mm. have a go at this because it's easy and it's right here and it enables me to transact. Mm. And so for New Zealand businesses, we tend to see, as you know, Blink Pay is a SaaS company, we're building new payment services. We tend to see that a lot of merchants, they have a finite set of payment services and it's often a function of the relationships that they have or what they've taken on. And some of it is based on their appetite to do things. And other times it's based on, we don't have the technical capability to go beyond these things. Mm. And so ultimately where I think the world's going through a connected payments ecosystem is a lot of businesses are looking for just one integration that allows them to do every kind of payment option they can think of, then they can pick and mix which payments they use. And so we also see this growing trend in New Zealand as well as in other geographies around the world that, oh no, I want to pay in a way that suits me, mm -hmm. not based on your limited options. I don't want to do it that way. I don't want to pay with a credit card. I want to be able to pay from directly from my account without any fees. And so there's this growing body of evidence and some would argue it's a millennial thing if you look at demography, but that's what's happening in the world is people want to pay in a way that makes the most sense to them. And merchants can't afford to integrate every kind of payment solution that's out there. So you need to find something that sort of sits in the middle of that Venn diagram. Mm. Yeah. Joe, what do you make of that? Because, of course, that point he raises there is extremely important. The, the idea of being able to trust mm. the payment system, that it's all going to come through, that it's going to work for everyone. That must be difficult from a banking perspective to be embracing new technologies, new ways of doing things and making sure that that trust stays top of mind and also that you're meeting all the regulations. There, there must be restrictions around that, right? Exactly right, yeah. yeah. So there is definitely the trust component, and that's what the banks, to Adrian's point actually, the banks bring to the relationship. Mm -hmm. So by working in a um, cohesive manner with emerging payment technologies, you can bring that trust and flexibility. That's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. To find that, that middle space where you know, you've got the, the trusted components and, and, and ultimately user choice. That's what I feel it really comes down to. You've got to give something for every demographic There'll be people that'll be comfortable with cash. There'll be people that'll be comfortable with card. There'll be people that will want to do fast and shiny and new things to do it quicker. But ultimately, all those payments need to get from A to B. Mm. And historically, that's been the bank's mandate is to ensure that the trust in that payment is there. If we can work closely with fintech companies and paytech businesses to ensure that there's a comfort level there, be it through bilateral agreements, be it through you know, master service contracts with them, be it with just understanding how they're working and having comfort with the people in those businesses, then we can get to a place where we can say, well, yeah, there's trust, there's speed, there's comfort, um, perfect world. We get to a space where no matter how you want to pay, you can pay, and no matter how you want to get paid, you'll get paid mm -hmm. and as quickly and as um, effectively as possible. Yeah, and that point you make there about having the different options, mm -hmm. that must be important, right? Because you'd have customers at different levels of comfort. And, you know, from different areas, people might prefer different things. You know, we, we even see in some of the rural areas, they get very upset if the bank closes a branch mm -hmm. because they like going in in person. So do you think that's a good thing to have different options for different types of customer? Certainly. I think you have to weigh up some of the historical ways of banking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to weigh up the, um, the one or two upset versus the many that are comfortable with the digital transformation. Um, but also you need to be able, you know, part of our mandate as a bank is financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. So we need to ensure that people do feel that they can get banked. Maybe some of that is education. Maybe some of that is bringing people along the journey to digital transformation. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to be able to offer that for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, Adrian, obviously there's, there's tight regulations in this space for often very good reasons. Um, so what is it like internationally? in terms of the regulations, how does that impact things here in New Zealand, do you think? So in New Zealand, we've had this industry-led approach to trying to build this new payments network based on the open banking standards of the UK. Mm. And that was born out of some legislation in Europe. So there's the Payment Service 
Directive 2, which basically, hey, we need to do more transparency on payments and data. And it then spawned the open banking as it is revolution. Now, let's ignore that term. It's kind of weird. Not Most people don't understand it. But essentially what it was is can we facilitate making payments from your account to other accounts in a really seamless way? And also, can we make accessible your data so with your consent we can be reused in clever ways? Mm. Now, uh, if you look at how that then um, sort of transpired in Australia around the consumer data right, the Australians went quite a, they took a very nuanced approach to it, uh, which has then caused it to be less effective. Whereas in New Zealand, the latest exposure draft on the customer product data bill has a bit of an, a philosophical goal and then some principles, <laughs> but it's not as prescriptive. And so there'll be a camp that argue, well, the devil's in the detail. We need to understand what this looks like in practice, right? And there'll be others who say, oh, as long as we clear on the goal, we'll figure out how to get there later. It's cool as. <laughs> and so from our perspective, um, it does introduce some very interesting sort of nuances, but it does create some tailwinds. So at the heart of the CPD bill, Customer Product Data Bill, is this idea that we give the power back to the consumer of their own data. Mm. So you own the data today, if I was still in British banking, if someone said, can I have my data, I'd say, hey, it's my data, mate, and we're going to have to do a bunch of things before I give it back to you. Um, but under CPD bill, I'll be able to request my data, and with the appropriate consents, I'll be able to access it either directly or via third parties. So it's kind of a significant extension to the Privacy Act, whereas the Privacy Act, you can do OFIs and all that goodly stuff, but there's, you know, 20 days of data to turn up, and mm. the, the penalties are fairly out of kilter with what can mm. happen with data in this regard. Mm. And, but what that does mean, though, is if I have the ability to, with consent to request my data, what, as a business, as a merchant, as a, a, a lending institution, why would I send my customers away to go find three months of printed statements with, with the right data connection mm -hmm. and consent? I can pull back all that data in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And then I can make an affordability assessment. I can decide if I can actually give you that mortgage you're desperate for. That's amazing. Okay, so when New Zealand businesses are looking at that context then, how would that impact when they're developing products and services and how should it impact? Well, the thing is, what the world, we're in the data revolution. Like, mm. let's be honest, I made this comment in front of the Reserve Bank in New Zealand, they kind of bristled. I said, we don't actually send money between bank accounts, we just send data. Mm. And it goes to that bank and they promise to let you take out that amount of money at some point in the future when you wish to. But it's not actual money exchanging hands, it's just data. And so when you realise that actually a lot of the physical aspects are probably less important, it's actually the data itself, then it really changes the conversation. So if I'm a small to medium-sized enterprise, I might be spending a lot of time manually handling things like, I don't know, there might be filling in forms and chasing things down and retyping stuff. But in the age of ubiquitous and available data, you don't need to. Hmm. You just put in the right request and then suddenly you, you reduce a lot of operational drag. Suddenly you don't need back office teams, and I'm not meaning to say we should get rid of jobs, but suddenly a lot of operational inefficiency goes to the wayside. Hmm. At the risk of pumping up our own tires, hmm. we have this bills product where we basically take your bill from your biller and put it in the same place you manage your financial life into your mobile app. And in doing so, by having that view of that bill, we enable you to pay that bill in the same place that you would be paying things anyway. Mm -hmm. And all that data is pre-populated from the bill, so there's no user errors, there's no misdirected payments because the receiving account and the recipient are all pre-loaded. All you do is check it and hit go. Mm -hmm. Now, at the risk of giving away some sort of commercially sensitive stuff, the results so far for the one major news on bill on it are nothing short of astounding. So obfuscating the data a little, four out of five people are paying their bill on the day it arrives in their mobile app, which for that particular bill, I brought forward their payment or their cash flow by nearly 14 days. That's pretty good. Mm. Mm. And so we're trying to impress upon people that this kind of data is valuable and actually if we're thoughtful about it, we can spend less time devoted doing manual processing type stuff and actually focus on doing clever value added stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of our mention, what we're trying to do and that's why we like to work with forward thinking folks. I mean, yeah, the point that you make there about getting rid of some of the, the drudge work, right? And like you say, I often think people do get scared of losing jobs over this. I often think it just gets rid of drudge work and lets people be freed up to focus on the more interesting stuff, the more rewarding stuff. And as you say, the value add, which can really, that can boost up the business if you can free up time for that. I mean, Joe, growth sectors and technology industries recently created subsectors. Tell us 
a bit about those and how it supports New Zealand businesses. Sure. So um, f for context behind it, I guess tech is the fastest growing industry in New Zealand. You know, um, according to Tin Report, it's seven times faster than the economy in 2022. Oh. So we are seeing a huge growth in this sector. It's becoming our second largest export sector. Um, and from that, what we have discovered is that historically, it hasn't been well banked by the main banks and well understood in the banking sector in New Zealand. Uh, very hard for businesses to come and talk to a bank about a tech startup. Um, so what we've done in this space is uh, within the tech subsector, which is a growth sector at BNZ, mm -hmm. we've created subsector leads, of which one I'm one of, I'm focusing on emerging payments and pay tech. Now, for me, that means that supporting businesses in this space, I'm looking to give them, I guess, one-on-one -on -one support early, which they wouldn't get historically until they were much bigger. Mm. Give them levels of uh, expertise into how we can do stuff for them, how we can connect them with internal teams so that they get the right advice from people within the bank. We're not trying to um, tell them how to do their business. That's not our job. But what we're trying to do is remove barriers that might be there that shouldn't be, um, you know, just by people not understanding that industry. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, open data, open banking, uh, send, uh, digital currency, uh, looking at uh, digital uh, wallets, uh, all different levels of verticals within pay tech and emerging payments. And another area, I guess, in the business space is helping some of those traditional large businesses navigate through uh, what is a changing landscape. So as Adrian mentioned, you know, a large company using BlinkPay has seen a huge uptake how do we ensure that we are approaching the market, giving them what we can support, what we can solve for, and what out there is cohesive to their business and can help them, can collaborate with them mm -hmm. to support what they need to do to make it better for both them as a business, for cash flow, better for their consumers. That's so interesting that tech is absolutely booming. I feel like there is a perception within New Zealand that it's, it's not our sphere. Mm. And it doesn't take much scratching to realize just how much tech um, tech sector work is going on. Mm. When you say it's, it's getting towards being our second biggest export, is that replacing tourism? Yeah, behind dairy. Yeah. Wow, that must be massive. And it, it must be interesting as a bank. And I, I find it very reassuring that they're bringing in people like yourself to be an industry expert, someone who's across the industry and able to work with it. Because of course you have responsibilities, you can't take too much risk. Assessing the risk for startups in order to work with them properly must be quite tricky and take a level of expertise. That's exactly right. I think historically you'd see a phone call to an 0800 number if you're a startup mm. and you, you, know, you say I'm an AML reporting entity and a financial service provider and you'd probably get a blank silence for about you know, 30 seconds because they wouldn't know how to treat you, <laughs> right? They wouldn't understand your business, they wouldn't understand your model. Now what we want to do is educate and bring up our staff so that if that phone call comes in, um, we don't miss the next big business in New Zealand and we don't stop them from growing at inception. We create almost a foundry so that they can grow within BNZ, feel comfortable that they're nourished, supported, mm -hmm. let them do what they want to do without facing into any, you know, misconceptions or perceived hurdles. Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in on that point a little bit? Mm. Um, obviously, we're biased because we love Joe. Um, <laughs> And the challenge you have as a startup is you have a limited capital runway. Mm. And so if you aren't able to get runs on the board, you will wither and die. Mm. And so that's part of the challenge as a startup is you want to try and get as much progress as possible. What Joe does magnificently is he basically spans the horizontal across a large complex organization. So a lot of people just worry about their pipes that they work in mm. and stuff can fall through the cracks. Joe just goes across the lot and plugs all the gaps in the dam to help everyone get up to speed. It's incredible. And, you know, hats off to BNZ for having that foresight. Thank you, Thank Joe. You. Put that in, in your next performance review. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be good. Just take that little clip there. Um, all right, we're pretty much out of time, but what I would love to get from you both as quick as we can is what are you looking at and excited for in this industry in the next 12 months? Start with you, Adrian. So the open banking implementation timelines for payments kick in on May 2024. So at that point in time, the big four banks are expected to have their payment APIs not only enabled, but connectable for third parties like ourselves. What that means is if we can connect the big four banks, we have 85 to 90% of the banked New Zealand market who can access these new payment services. Cool. That is exciting. All right, Joe, your turn. For me, it's uh, that freedom of choice and ability for both small businesses mm. to get paid mm -hmm. and for people to be able to pay easily. Mm 
Mm. We want to we want to create a fully inclusive payment network within New Zealand because we need to support those businesses grow. We need to support people with their choice to be able to pay on their terms. This is what digital solutions bring, be it our solutions, be it collaborative approaches. The more choice we can give to the New Zealand people, the better. Mm, oh, absolutely agree. Thank you both so much for your insights today. I think I agree. I think the next 12 months are going to be interesting and fun. That has been BNZ Connect. Thanks so much for watching.